am a Matt Miller flying solo today in the coast chair. Matt, always good to spend time with you and hang out. Thank you. Always good to be here. You've been quite the international traveler this year. It's been fun. It was a really good time on our trip to Brazil. And uh, coming up uh, next week, my wife and I will get a chance to head up to uh, Canada. First time I've ever been to Canada, so that'll be interesting crossing the border in a car it's one thing when you fly in and you go through customs at an airport but to be driving along and suddenly it's like i guess hitting the toll booth except it's a little more uh rigid right and uh and we may or may not let you in i i've not driven into mexico but i've driven into canada okay and this, this was pre 9 11 when you'd go across the bridge and they'd say uh state your purpose and i i don't know <laughs> just to see Canada. <laughs> you know, you have anything in the trunk, whatever. I'm like, no. All right, move along. I'm like, wow, they really trust you when you come into Canada. <laughs> the the uh, the uh, answer is not. I left the body in in the states. Don't worry about it. There's nothing in the trunk. <laughs> never never answer that way. <laughs> Our guest in this segment is uh, Delegate Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem. Paul, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. Uh, good morning, Rob. Good morning, Matt. Uh, Matt, I. I have traveled by car into Canada. Of course, uh, Rockwell's uh, head office is located in Milton, Ontario, and uh, it's really not uh, not that difficult. Now, I do have uh, a Nexus card, which is the travel document for folks that do travel relatively frequently between Canada and uh, the United States. It it uh, there is like a special lane that you can go through, but even without that, it just didn't really seem that. Uh, it did seem that busy, so uh, so I think you'll actually be fine. You'll probably be surprised how easy it is. So, yeah, just don't give any crazy answers. And <laughs> I think you'll be good to go. Yeah, I'll I'll reserve my bad sense of humor uh, for for other people, not for the person asking those <laughs> serious questions. <laughs> just say good idea. Just say a at the end of all of your questions. That, <laughs> here to visit, eh? Come yeah. on, do they really do that? Some do. Some do. Yeah. Uh, Paul, is is this the first time we've had you on since the primary election? I think it might. I think it might be. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, that's about three months now, I guess, to the to the day plus one. Yeah. I tell you, where is this uh, summer gone? I tell you, it has just uh, flown past. Uh, uh, just uh, you know, it's amazing how you know after the the heat that we've had, the hot weather that we've had, it, it's starting to feel a little bit about like fair weather because uh, of course you had the Berkeley County Fair last week and Jefferson County Fair is coming up next week and so it's. Uh, uh, it just seems like it's always been possible that the that summer's gone as fast as it has. Yeah. How's your football team looking, by the way? Well, we had pra- our first official practice was yesterday morning, and right. a lot of the line, most of our starters up front are back, and those kids are all bigger now after another year in the weight room. It's always amazing to see the transition between your junior year and your senior year. But the first practice, it's everybody. Now, the JV takes one half of the field, the varsity takes the other half of the field, and you're reintroduced to the fact of just how tiny ninth graders can be when you look at them and you go, this kid's going to play varsity football one day? Somehow they grow. They do. But when you look at that first crop of ninth graders that comes across the line, they're all – none. first off, none of them know how to work combination locks. And my job on orientation day is I get them all assigned a locker and tell them what their combination is. Uh, and we've got this down to a science now where I tell them to take out their phones and enter the combination into their phone because inevitably if I tell them the combo, they'll forget it between mm-hmm. their trip to the locker and back. And I get there early enough where I test each lock to make sure that it will open. We got 130 kids this year, which meant that me and another coach opened 130 combination locks to make sure that they all work. But inevitably, the ninth graders will come back and go, ah, my, my lock doesn't work, Coach. I'm like, yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yes, it does. I just opened it about half an hour ago. Get back there and try again. Turn it to the right, back to the, the left, left, back to the right. Pass your number. Right, there you go. <laughs> so that's, that's the most, honestly, that's the most challenging part of football practice, <laughs> getting ninth graders to work on the combination lock. Uh, well, I can remember back when uh, I was a member of the Martinsburg Rotary Club. I'm currently a member of the Charlestown Club, but... It was Dave Walker's first year, and uh, they had the football coaches on uh, uh, there for a luncheon, uh, just to prognosticate, kind of talk about their upcoming season. And it was uh, Coach Walker's first year, and uh, as I recall, I think Musselman was probably the team to beat that year, and Hedgesville was 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 uh, 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 and you know kind of the second choice, and then Martinsburg was kind of a rebuilding year, and I can re- still remember. 
Coach Walker, when it got around for him to have a chance to talk, he said, you know, you know, we're, we're probably not going to be real competitive this year, but it won't be, you know, if we're not, it won't be because we didn't work hard in the weight room because mm-hmm. that's, that's where we think we can uh, have an impact. And, uh, I tell you, that's, he, he's been uh, good to his word and just, uh, the, the work that his uh, teams put in the weight room, it definitely shows up on those offensive and defensive lines. Matt, you know that probably better than anybody watching, uh-huh. uh, watching the play. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they've got a great weight room to work in as well. So I remember the first game of Dave's second year, right? So the first year, I think they went two and eight. So they've been one and nine. Maybe one and nine. Yeah, I think it was one and nine. So the second year, they open up and they're down 40 to nothing at halftime to Musselman. Mm-hmm opener of the game number one season number mm-hmm. two and i was doing the game with john partington and we step outside the press box we're walking around at halftime a little bit probably on the way to the men's room or something and i hear a couple of uh, martinsburg fans some long timers who've been around a while going <laughs> maybe this walker guy wasn't a great choice <laughs> yeah well they they turned, turned it around right, <laughs> yeah <laughs> went six and four that second season and did make the playoffs that was the trip down to huntington yeah. and uh, almost pulled the upset of of huntington in that matchup um and and then we know the rest is history as yeah, they man. say paul uh, i think you folks have a an interim session coming up has it turned into a special session yet it has not and and i you know it's it's certainly there's still probably some time for that to happen but i think the time's getting a little bit late in order to really have uh, a significant agenda uh we are scheduled to be in legislative interims um uh sunday august 25th through the 27th so that's sunday through tuesday um you know, there have been, of course, talks with the governor. The governor, of course, proposed uh, perhaps accelerating the uh, tax cut based on the legislation we passed a few years ago uh, where we reduced uh, personal income tax by 21 and a quarter percent. Of course, we included a uh, fully refundable tax credit on your uh, automobiles. So make sure folks that are listening out there, make sure you're paying those uh those personal property taxes on your vehicles, make sure you pay those timely because in order to be able to claim those on your state tax return, they have to be paid timely. Uh, also, small businesses, I think, get a 50% uh, uh, refundable rebate on their equipment uh, tax. But uh, that did include a trigger, and uh, as a result of the trigger that uh, none other than our, than our own um, uh, majority leader, Eric Halsell, actually put together that, uh, that trigger, so that as we were able to demonstrate that the uh, West Virginia economy, both our revenues and our uh, fiscal restraint as far as spending, uh, all that would factor into perhaps additional uh, tax uh, reductions. And lo and behold, uh, this year, even though I think we, I think there was some some doubt, you know, how much of a tax cut would we we'd see. Uh, you know, the, the trigger allows for up to a, an additional ten percent tax cut uh, above and beyond the, the initial 21 and a quarter percent tax cut uh the when the, when all the math was was calculated here uh, fairly recently it came out to a four percent tax cut and then of course the governor i think has proposed perhaps uh, uh doing an additional five percent cut the uh, the plan when the after the governor had uh, had mentioned that he wanted to perhaps uh uh introduce legislation during a special session to accelerate that tax cut i believe it if i'm not mistaken i think it was the week of july 21st uh we were actually at uh, hosting the uh, southern legislative conference uh, here in west virginia and the plan was as i recall was uh, i think later later that week uh, uh, the governor's office uh, the tax and revenue office was scheduled to provide kind of their case for you know why we could uh go ahead and accelerate the um the tax cut uh we never did really receive that information that the, that the uh tax revenue office indicated that we would be receiving we had planned actually a call with uh, i know our republican caucus to basically kind of run through the numbers that the governor's office uh, was to have shared with us you know, so that, you know, all of our members could kind of get a little better sense for the, the rationale, uh, for the, uh, for accelerated tax cut. You know, obviously become a little bit more comfortable with it, uh, since we had just heard the uh, proposal, but that still has not happened. And so that's what leads me to believe, uh, 
Rob, that I think it's unlikely to uh, be able to move forward with that during our August interims. Uh, as you know, uh, just from covering the legislature, typically, unless there's an emergency situation, you really like to have uh, things you know, pretty much worked out uh, uh, with regard to proposed legislation during a special session so that you're not down there, you know, an extended period of time. Uh, you typically like to have non-controversial uh, topics so that you can basically, you know, within the, within the course of, you know, one to three days, be able to, to address that. While, again, I think there's broad support, obviously, for providing tax relief, I think without having the the information uh, to be able to really thoroughly vet it to make sure that, you know, we're not going down a road, uh, we're not uh, hastily reducing uh, personal income taxes further beyond what the trigger has already uh, uh, dictated uh, or, or suggested is a reasonable approach. I, I just don't know that we could accomplish that without, you know, having some time to prepare for that. So unless we get, you know, some significant information here fairly soon, I just – I just don't see um, I don't see you know how that item would would be able to be addressed during uh, during the August interims and uh, from talking with um, I'm trying to think if you were uh, no I think actually Mike was was hosting uh, yesterday when uh, House Finance Chair Vernon Chris was on uh, he he of course reminded folks that next uh, month uh, we'll actually we're scheduled to be uh, off campus if you will in Parkersburg for legislative interims. So unless we had a second gathering at the Capitol sometime during September, September is not probably going to be a good option unless unless you know they can work that out. Uh, so you might be actually looking at October, you know, if we, if we don't uh, have a uh, have a special session in September outside of the legislative interims, it'll be that second week in September. That Delegate Espinosa. Uh, that- Without the information that you were just talking about, that that you're kind of waiting to get from the governor, how comfortable would you be with expanding that tax break as he would like to do, or are you more content to say, "Hey, we wrote into our legislation these are the mechanisms that would increase that that income tax r- reduction"? Let's just stick with that. Well, I, I'm certainly open to it, but I'd like to. Again, I'd like to see the case. Uh, the tax and revenue folks, uh, they've got some really sharp folks there. And, uh, again, if, if they can make the case that, yes, we could do this comfortably, you know, I, I might be inclined to support that. I, I, I do think there's something to be said for what uh, Senate President uh, Craig Blair and um, uh, Senate Finance Chair Eric Tarr have shared on your program with regard to some of the items that are out there lurking that, you know, are going to need to be addressed if we're going to con- continue to control the expenditure side of the equation, uh, namely uh, the unemployment insurance program. Uh, of course, we did pass some legislation during the last session that slowed the bleeding, didn't quite stop the bleeding, but slowed the bleeding on that unemployment insurance uh, uh, program uh, trust fund, if you will. And uh, also, there's the BRIM insurance program out there. There's, I know there's been some discussions that, you know, without some structural uh, changes in the BRIM program, that's the state uh, liability program that covers state agencies and some other uh, government agencies in West Virginia. Without addressing that, you know, there are some, uh, some uh, potential increased liabilities that could come uh, down the road. And so uh, I do... Uh, I do think there's something to be said for uh, continuing to uh, uh, appropriately address some of those structural issues. You know, if we, if we do want to uh, look at accelerating the tax uh, reduction, the tax cuts, then I think we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that we're not going to see uh, large additional uh, expenditures uh, that uh, that are resulting from are in action, you know, and on some of those structural type changes that uh, that uh, the Senate and others have have suggested. With the committees and so forth that you are involved with, uh, what would you see right now at the forefront of your mind in in this upcoming August interim session? What what is it that that you see being the, the important issue or things that you really need to deal with? 
Well, the three committee, the three interim committees that I've served on are, of course, House or the Joint Committee on uh, Finance. So, uh, you know, we'll get a better understanding of where our, our finances look. Of course, we saw our first uh, July numbers uh, here, but uh, we'll uh, we'll see uh, uh, we'll see the you know probably start to get a snapshot as what what our numbers are going to look like here. Uh, you know, as we you know move through uh, August. So, uh, so we'll you know we'll hear we'll that'll be kind of a I'm sure the the main topic of discussion will probably be on, you know, how are the numbers looking and uh, whatever information that the uh, revenue uh, department can share as far as uh, uh, information that would support accelerating a tax cut. I also uh, co-chair the Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources Subcommittee. One of the things I'm uh, very proud of is the fact that over the last I'd say probably uh, four or five years we have uh, made significant investments in our state park, uh, uh, our state parks across West Virginia, and uh, you know something to the tune of probably several hundred million dollars, including uh, our own uh, Capon State Park uh, here in Morgan County. And um, what we've seen is the the visitorship uh, for our state parks has just exploded and. It probably couldn't have come a better time, you know, some of the improvements that we had made because particularly during COVID when a lot of folks, frankly, were looking for ways to get out of some of the urban metropolitan areas, uh, they uh, saw West Virginia as a, as a a good place to be able to uh, uh, visit, you know, not be uh, in such a crowded atmosphere as some of the urban areas. And because of some of the improvements that we've seen, the repeat visitorship has is, is also been very, very strong. And so we uh, do uh, anticipate hearing an update on the capital improvements program that our state parks are continuing to undertake to just make sure that uh, our visitors, both our in-state visitors and those folks from out of state, have a positive experience when they visit our parks. So that's uh, uh, the, the main agenda item there. We do have a uh, technology and infrastructure meeting and uh, yeah, I'm sure. The, I haven't seen an agenda yet for our for the, for that meeting during August interims, but certainly we'll anticipate uh, getting an update on where the broad the various broadband uh, expansion programs are. And uh, you know that I, I know I, I hear frequently from folks. Okay, we, we know there's lots of money that uh, that's coming uh, from from both the federal and, and state uh, uh, sources, but uh, when, when are we going to have uh, expanded broadband in my area? And so. Uh, looking forward, to, uh, I know, along with my colleagues in the legislature, hearing more about that and, and when you know, our constituents can anticipate you know, beginning to see some of those projects actually uh, you know, uh, getting underway and, and having positive impacts on connectivity. Yeah, as you said the word technology as a part of that committee, that was right where my mind went. Here's my address. Can you tell me when I'm going to get that service? No, I'm just kidding. I won't go there. Uh, Nelly and Paul Espinosa, no, our uh, guest here. It, th- those, it's not unusual to receive those inquiries, and I tell you, our, our broadband office has been pretty good at uh, you know trying to provide uh, you know some estimates uh, based on where you know where uh, folks are located. And uh, uh, I'd say you know, probably the one thing that West Virginia uh, did that uh, I think positions us very well to actually be a, a little ahead of the 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 curve as far as actually deploying some of those broadband expansion funds is the mapping process that we did. I think West Virginia uh, really, uh, we have been commended for being able to identify where are the areas where either folks are unserved or underserved. And uh, uh, West Virginia has been held up as a model for being able to really uh, appropriately identify that so that uh, the the uh, approval for the various projects that uh, are planned over the coming years, you know, can, uh, you know, th- those those approvals can come forward uh, fairly quickly because uh, we have been able to document that, yes, this is an area where there is not uh, broadband service or uh, where it's significantly underserved. Paul, I want to take you back to uh, primary election day and – think back to May 14, you won in Berkeley County, lost in Jefferson County by just slightly more than what you won in Berkeley County by. Uh, You're a Jefferson County resident. Tell me the 
analysis that you have as you look at Berkeley County and Jefferson County and how that vote turnout came about? Well, I think one of the big challenges was just the, the turnout uh, uh, in Berkeley County, where I think I won 58, 59 percent of the vote. Uh, unfortunately, the voter turnout was only 17 or 18 percent, as I recall. And as uh, as we looked at the race, uh, you know, I knew that uh, Senator Rucker would do well in Jefferson County. Obviously, she's from uh, she's from Jefferson County, has served that area. A lot of the Berkeley County area was a foot was uh uh, you know, areas where neither she or I had served. So I really thought that there was an opportunity to do well there. And, uh, and I did again, won 58, almost 59% of the vote. As we projected the, the number of voters that would participate, uh, in the Republican primary, uh, uh, during a presidential year, looking at the last two presidential elections, we actually forecast an additional 1,400 voters in the Republican primary just in Berkeley County. And when those 1,400 folks did not, you know, materialize because of the low turnout, you know, I, I knew it was probably when I started to see some of the returns of Berkeley County, even though I was winning, winning, uh, you know, by a pretty good uh, clip uh, percentage, I, I, I kind of feared that the, uh, the numbers just would not pan out. It, uh, in just three precincts up on the mountain in Harpers Ferry, uh, Patricia outperformed me by about 400 votes just in three precincts on the mountain. And again, although I, I, I won Berkeley County handily, I just with that, with the low turnout, just did not uh, generate the numbers to offset, you know, what, what I, you know, wasn't surprised would be a strong performance, particularly up in some of the uh, Harpers Ferry area of Jefferson County. About two minutes remain here, Paul. There will be a significant change in representation and leadership out of the Eastern Panhandle once February kicks in. There's a new governor and a new uh, House is seated, a new Senate is seated. Uh, first and foremost, when does the transition of your office take place with that February legislative session this year being the start? Yeah, well, we uh, will basically kind of follow the model that uh, – that the uh, Senate has followed uh, for, uh, you know, for a number of years. And it's essentially when that new legislature is seated uh, during that first uh, uh, session in January, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that is, I think that is January the 8th. Uh, it might be the, the following week, but anyway, that first uh, session, that's when actually uh, there is a, a process by which the, the secretary of state pre presents the, certified uh, election results uh, to the legislature. The legislature essentially accepts those. And then it's at that point that the new legislature is sworn in at that point. So that's, that's technically when, uh, when the new legislature takes over. And then they, what, they don't come back till February then when the governor's term begins. That's right. They'll do basically just some organizational things. They'll actually elect their presiding officers in both the house and the Senate. Then they will immediately adjourn for 30 days and that's to allow the incoming governor, uh, the new governor, to uh, have some time, obviously, to prepare, uh, not only finalize uh, uh, his, in this case, it'll be his cabinet, and then uh, obviously put together a budget, which uh, which will be presented during the state of the state, which would occur, uh, you know, after the legislature reconvenes after that 30-day uh, recess. Let me ask you, as a, a I've only got thirty seconds oh, left. I was just because, as a, as a, an outgoing delegate, are are you there for that kind of transition, or or you're not there? Ten seconds, Paul. Not for that. No, no. just we'll be. You know, we have legislative interims just about every month up until uh, until that point. But uh, that's pretty much for the new legislature to begin. You know, making those type of decisions as to what the next session is going to look like. Paul, thank you very much. Have a great day, sir. Good to be with you.